really fitting that we call this program Entrepreneur's Journey because Pepperdine has actually been on its own entrepreneurial journey since it was founded in 1905. And if you look around the university and look at the significant names of people who have supported this university through the years, almost all of them are entrepreneurs. We, of course, were founded by George Pepperdine, who was an entrepreneur. Seaver College is named for an entrepreneurial family. And of course, our namesake in the business school, uh, George Grazia Dio, is a, a renowned entrepreneur throughout Los Angeles. And himself as a banker was a great friend to entrepreneurs and that was really his passion as a banker so uh, so it's a real privilege to continue that heritage and tradition of Pepperdine with what we're doing in our entrepreneurship entrepreneurship program here in the business school uh, and the entrepreneur's journey is certainly a piece of that so we appreciate having you here and know it's going to be a wonderful experience we had a really rich time with this last year and it's uh, going to be even better I know this year as I've looked over those on the panel before I introduce our uh, keynote speaker today, I do want to make uh, one special introduction. Uh, we have uh, Stephen Calvillo with us. He is the chair of our Board of Visitors, and he is the son-in-law of George Grazia Dio. So Stephen, stand up and be recognized, and thank you so much for joining us today. It's really a privilege to introduce our uh, keynote speaker today uh, for many reasons. He's certainly an accomplished business person, but he's also a part of uh, the Pepperdine community. He's an alumnus of our MBA program and actually taught for uh, uh, several years in our full-time MBA program here on the Malibu campus. Uh, but he was drawn back to the business uh, world uh, when he was asked to serve as chief product officer at Yahoo, uh, where he leads the company's products organization and, and is really responsible for the vision, strategy, design, and development of Yahoo's global consumer and advertising product portfolio. So just a little job that keeps him busy on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, he was appointed in April, and many in uh, the virtual community sort of considered that a shot heard around the internet because Yahoo had long wanted to bring him on board uh, because he had worked for a number of years with uh, Microsoft, and uh, they were beginning a program where they were launching a massive search and online advertising partnership with Microsoft. So it was very fortuitous timing that brought Yahoo and Blake together in that. He did work at, Yah at Microsoft for 15 years prior to going to Yahoo, where he was in charge of their Windows Live platform group and led a team of over 4,000 people who operated Microsoft's internet scale services platform, advertiser and developer ecosystem, um, and really did a, a tremendous job there uh, before leaving the company in 2007. It was after that that we had the privilege of having him teach with us. And uh, I know our students here uh, were sad to see him go and lose him in the classroom because he did such a tremendous job for us. Um, according to his Facebook page, uh, he lives in... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I won't share too much of what's on your Facebook page. <laughs> But he lives up the road in a very laid-back San Luis Obispo, and I think he uh, is, a, is a very laid-back personality in many ways, although certainly very driven from a business perspective. Uh, but today, I'm uh, proud to welcome him back home to, to Pepperdine, and we're so glad to have you with us, Blake, and look forward to your comments. Thank you. Okay, we've got a clicker up here. Let's see. That, that would be me, isn't, I guess. So how many people in here have a Facebook page? Right? Yeah, so you, you kind of know how that can go sometimes. My 13-year-old has a, a Facebook page. Had it for about a, a week. Within a week, he had 250 people in his group, 13. We have finally said, you have permission. Uh, and uh, this one day, he actually uh, changed his status to uh, in a relationship. <laughs> You know, and my, my comment uh, on my wall was, uh, WTF, you're in a relationship? <laughs> and uh, and the, other, the other folks, the, the, uh, apparently he took such a brow beating from his buddies. I mean, this is just the unintended consequences of, you know, large social groups, right? He, he got brow beaten by his buddies so badly that he changed his, uh, his uh, status to single again and inadvertently broke up with his girlfriend. <laughs> so... You know, it's a cyber world. So, um, why am I, uh, well, just first of all, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about 
the journey of a serial intrapreneur, if you haven't uh, heard that uh, phrase before, uh, you probably have. Um, I'm, I'm not an entrepreneur, you know, frankly. Um, but I have a tremendous respect for them. I was in LA actually to do two things that were, that sort of bookended my trip. Uh, Yahoo has a campus in Burbank and a campus in Santa Monica. I spent some time there on the last couple of days and then actually spoke uh, at the underground on uh, Wednesday, it was a Wednesday night at a um, event for technology startups and folks that are in technology companies and just want to get the skinny. So Daniel Lewin and I, Daniel who actually is a good friend and runs the, uh, the Microsoft program that gets, gets startups going and funded, uh, and I did a Q&A session with Jason Nazar, if anybody knows Jason as the moderator. Jason was uh, the president of uh, the MBA class, I think, probably in uh, early 2000s uh, and runs a company called DocStock. Very impressive young man if you've ever met Jason, uh, and he moderated. And so this whole week has basically been about uh, entrepreneurialism for me, even when I've been talking with uh, people at Yahoo, because that's one of the things we're trying to inspire inside that company. I'll talk about entrepreneurialism and what that, um, what that actually um, means. So um, the journey of a serial entrepreneur is, is um, kind of funny. So an uh, entrepreneur is somebody who actually does that same kind of thing that you have a passion for and a spark for uh, inside a big company. Um, Someone, you know, once said, you know, the best thing, you, I guess, before all else, know, uh, know thyself. And you really have to know yourself very well to become an entrepreneur. Um, I, I'm, I'm not one. You know, and there's a lot of reasons why I'm not one. You know, I have tremendous respect for those who are. So... Entrepreneurs are risk takers, right? I mean, what, what are the similarities between um, an entrepreneur and an intrapreneur? Entrepreneurs are risk takers, which I have deep, deep respect for. In fact, I was having uh, dinner with uh, a guy named Ross Levinson, who Yahoo just hired as our uh, EVP of the Americas region. And Ross and I, before we started at Yahoo, were both kind of, uh, we kind of called it dabbling, but we were doing board work for a lot of small companies. And the amount of risk that folks take on to become entrepreneurs uh, is pretty, pretty tremendous. You know, there's no guaranteed paycheck. There's no guaranteed path. You better know exactly who you are because you're going to confront yourself every day in ways that are fundamental to you and your, uh, your entire company. You know, f for me, an entrepreneur allowed me to have sort of a secured road of you know, I knew where my paycheck was coming from. I could take risks. I didn't have to worry about, you know, uh, this company failing and having everybody, go, you know, have to fold doors and have them leave. You know, you have to be somebody who can put up with that kind of position. And, you know, I'm not. Truth be told, I actually taught a class here called Marketing Entrepreneurial Ventures, and I'd bring in three folks that were in one stage, whether it's series A, early stage, maybe pre-seed, they're doing it with their own money. Each one of these people had the same DNA. They all had the same DNA. They were willing to put it all out there because they were passionate about an idea and were willing to take risks that nobody else was. Because they thought, that idea is right. I know it's crazy and it seems like it's wrong, but it's right. I know it's right. The more people that tell me it's wrong makes me more affirmed that it's right. Any of you? Yeah. So, why am I not an entrepreneur? Well, most of the entrepreneurs that I've talked to grew up in a family, strangely enough, where there was sort of this assumed sense of risk-taking in the job where their folks were either in retail, and again, Ross Levinson's an interesting example of a guy who's a risk-taker, but his dad was a, a guy who started a business. Actually, it turned into Barney's, which is a pretty good-sized business now. But, uh, you know, it started, it got really big, and it folded this business, and he got it back going again. You know, so it was this hero to zero to hero again, and Ross went through that. And because he went through it, he had this, this reaction that was like, um, I'm not doing that. I'm going to go get a job with the company and try to see if I can make that happen inside it. For me, I grew up in a, uh, I grew up in a government household. My dad was an FBI agent. And it was just assumed that you go, I hate to say this, work for the man. You know, I guess you forget that maybe you are the man, but 
You go, you go work for the man, you just take the paycheck home, you have your passions that happen outside of work. He was a jazz musician, he was doing all this other stuff, and his was his job. So I ended up with this, this DNA or this uh, set of learn, learnings that I had growing up that was like, well, I need to have that paycheck. I need to know that where that's coming from. But I had this other passion that my dad had outside of the workplace that I always had these ideas and things that were always kind of, uh, you know, flowing. So I actually was very passionate about music. I became a musician. Uh, LA Union, San Diego Union was playing a bunch here. Uh, anybody ever tried to do that? Terrible way to make a living. Don't do it. Uh, you work in a very bizarre lifestyle, it's quite difficult. Uh, and while I was doing that, I was getting an undergrad actually in, uh, in, in fine art, strange enough. I know I'm a technology guy, but uh, there's a key to all this. This will all make sense in a minute. It'll all wrap together. Um, so I was doing music, I was doing art, I was doing typography. I was actually doing typographical design, which is this nice little thing that weaves art and math together. Xerox came in, uh, was looking at class portfolios, saw my portfolio, said, would you like to work here? I said, yes. They said, would you uh, like to start doing digital typography? I said, yes. Started to get in computers, started to design digital type for workstations and laser printers, uh, applied to Pepperdine to get an MBA, and all of a sudden, I started to figure out that, oh my God, you can take all of these things that you're passionate about and you can apply them to a business but I still had that DNA that said I wasn't going to go take a flyer and try to do it by myself. So I started just generating ideas inside these other companies. Um, and at Xerox, I ended up, uh, while I was in my MBA program getting the Chairman's Award for Innovation for starting a business based on doing this ty you know, random type of graphic stuff and turning it into a business just because I was getting an MBA here. So I, I tell that story to folks that are in my classroom just to say, look, it's not just about school. You can apply everything you're learning, like in the real world right now, and make stuff um, happen. So that is sort of how I ended up getting into the technology world, and I just fell in, uh, fell in love with it. Went to a couple of different companies, did the same thing at Compaq and Hewlett Packard, which is now Hewlett Packard, it was Compaq back in the day. Um, and then ended up at Microsoft. And Microsoft is a very interesting uh, place. Microsoft actually, like, is, think of it as a, an environment that's a giant, um, what would I say? It's like the Bay Area, right? It's like the Bay Area environment. There are lots of brilliant folks that are all in the technology business. They all want to kind of do something that's a startup, but they all sort of had that DNA that I had that said, I didn't want to try to do it on my own, so I'm working for this company, but I have this idea, and I want to see if I can go catch fire somewhere. And Microsoft actually had a culture where they allowed you to go produce ideas and make things happen in a weird way. So just like uh, in the VC world, I had a, the good fortune of having a guy that, was, that read a couple of papers that I was writing about stuff that I thought was going to matter. Um, my boss thought I was an idiot. His boss, and I'm not sure he wasn't right, but his boss thought I was crazy. His boss thought what I was writing about was pretty interesting. And that guy's, uh, his name was Paul Moritz, and he's now the CEO at VMware, if anybody knows the guy. Uh, and he said, you know, that's interesting enough that I think we're going to let you go try, try that out. And so in, in that environment, just like a VC, here's your first round, which was you can do this, and here's enough money to go do some contracts, and here's this guy who's a program manager who's, who did VB, and he's really good, and you guys will like each other. And, so we sort of produced a founding team. We did some work, put together a, a more executable plan, and he uh, gave us some more resources. And then he gave us some more resources. And we went up to Bill and Steve and said, this is what we want to go do. It's going to take some more resources. He gave us some more, and voila, we were able to actually um, get this thing in the marketplace. And it was something called, uh, that you probably wouldn't know, more shelfware nowadays, called NetMeeting, which allowed us to do video, voice, and uh, application sharing on the web. And it just started as a wacky idea that we then said, you know, people are going to communicate real time. They're also going to communicate non real time. We did Outlook Express. Then we did something that we knew we had a problem, problem identification, and turned that into MSN Messenger, which became a pretty good sized business, which turned into a bunch of other things that, you know, ended up making a bunch of money and turned into the Windows Live platform over the course of uh, seven to 10 years and making about a billion and a half dollars, which wasn't what we intended. What we intended was just to have this passion for how do we actually change the people's lives in a way that fundamentally makes them different. 
And that is something that entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs have in common. For all our differences that I talked about, that DNA, those changes, there's this one thing that both have, and it's this passion, and I've used, I use passion a lot in my classroom too. It's a passion to do something that you think nobody else gets. This passion to know that there's an opportunity there and you figure out how to go do it. And fundamentally, the things that charge me up is being able to go change people's lives at scale. That's why I ended up at Yahoo. How can you actually do something that is so fundamentally different that it changes people's lives in numbers that are, you know, just don't make sense? And a respect for good process, focus uh, on execution, almost nearing obsession. You know, even process and execution starts with a, a vision, starts with a plan, starts with a more instrumented plan. And actually at Yahoo, we started this thing uh, with a few months after I started called 22200. Two-page vision doc, 20-page execution, initiative document, and operating plan. And right now, we are in the throes of developing an operating plan for 2011. The vision is three years, right? Got to have a vision that's longer than you know, your fiscal year and allows you to put a stake in the ground. And then we execute monomaniacally on a quarterly, weekly, uh, daily basis in terms of doing daily builds, in terms of getting uh, product features into the marketplace. That, that's, that's the deal. And you measure and you iterate. And these are all things that little companies and big companies should be doing. Entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs. Focus on the future, focus on a vision, and then execute monomaniacally and do it quickly. Well, I'm kind of lucky because I'm in the web business. Uh, the web business has cost of goods, but it all sits back in a data center somewhere. I don't have to fill a channel. I don't have goods sitting on shelves. I don't have an inventory other than things that are bits that sit on uh, servers. And I can put my product out and I can take it down. I can put it out, I can take it down. I can change a feature while it's in market and we can actually measure everything that a customer is doing with our product to know what features are actually being used and what features are not being used. You know, I, I would love my brother to be able to figure out how to do that in his business because he builds houses. Right? Imagine if you could get that kind of feedback in something that has that much capital expense. Now, that technology that I'm just talking about, that is starting to get built into something that you think of as being pretty hard, durable goods. Uh, you know, how many folks know that their automobiles actually have the ability to actually start talking back to uh, you know, a large data center telling them what's being used and what's not being used and how your car's being driven. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Yeah, but uh, it's happening. So those things are very important to, uh, to mark in terms of similarities between the two. And, you know, so interestingly enough, most of the, the, most of the folks that I talk to that, are on, on, that believe that they are entrepreneurs start with this. I've got this big gnarly idea and that's really all I need. I've got the big idea and now I'm just going to go talk to a whole bunch of people about my big idea and then we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens, right? There's a lot of questions that they sort of forget to ask along the way when they have that big idea. Is it new? Is it really big? How, how do you know? How did you test it? Did you test it? Did you just keep it secret and not let anybody know? Which a lot of people think sometimes is a really good idea. Got this big idea, but I'm not going to tell anybody because I want to. I'm afraid they're going to take it. You know that that is that's folly. I guarantee you. Actually, I think the my, my brother who I've referenced once before, m massively smarter than me. Um, you know, Mensa type guy says, you know, I know that if I've had a fantastic idea, the one thing I know for sure is it isn't mine. It's probably, it's probably the accumulation of three or four different things that I've observed that were other people's ideas, and now I'm just going to go put it together in packages in a way that is different. And strangely enough, um, you know, it, it doesn't come down to the big idea. It comes down to... Um, You know, knocking the thing out of the park and executing. Really, it's about execution. Your big idea, I guarantee it, is somebody else's big idea too. With a little nuance, yours probably is. Yours is probably different. But it's not about 
the idea. It's about execution. Let's talk about some reasons why folks don't succeed. Poor execution. So if you have a big idea and you haven't actually put the instrumentation into your business that allows you to measure, that allows you to goal people, that allows you to actually see if you're on track, um, that's going to be a showstopper for you. There's a company that I'm affiliated with up in uh, San Luis Obispo, strangely, of all places, called Mind Body Online. And this is one of the companies I brought into class for the kids to, the kids, yeah, I'm old, for the students to spend time actually sort of pulling apart what this company should do. Um, th th this guy had uh, something that he brought in that he called the MOAS, the mother of all spreadsheets. <laughs> oh, right. And, and, and uh, so if you can imagine, so I'm just going to, if you imagine that I'm broadcasting a PC screen up here, right? This guy's spreadsheet, column and rows, would, would have filled three halls this size and, and probably about three ceilings to floor uh, lengths. It was that big. And he just, this was like a viewer into his spreadsheet that would meander all over. And he brought it in and he showed what would happen if he added one more sales resource. One more sales resource per metric. And the entire spreadsheet changes and kicks out an ROI on the back end. How hard do you think it was for this guy to get his series uh, A round? Or his B round? Not so hard. He talked about his vision, he talked about his strategy, and you know, the VCs, and I'm on his, I'm on his uh, board of advisors, and the VCs are kind of, all right, all right. And then he broke out Moaz. <laughs> <laughs> and these, these guys are just like, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. It had every detail of this guy's business. He was so buttoned up on execution that you just wanted to be part of it. You have to do that. You've got to actually do great execution. Poor execution will hose you. Other thing that will hose you is you started for the wrong reason. If you started for that reason, I'm going to be rich. Woo. Or I don't want to work for the man. Um, that's, uh, that's not the, way, the reason to start uh, a business. Right? The reason to start the business is I have an idea. It's crazy. I'm passionate about it. I think I can change the world with it, or I think I can change economics, or I think I can, you know, whatever. But it's got to be about that passion. Sure, your passion can be cash, but it has to be a passion because your venture, and as an intrapreneur, this is still true to this day, and even though I'm running a team of 6,000 people, I still consider myself an intrapreneur. Your passion has to be so strong because this thing is going to eat you alive, right? It's, it will become your life. Two companies that we recently acquired, one called Citizen Sports, the other called Associated Content. Both of these CEOs, around 30, 20, 29, 30, brilliant guys. Luke Beatty, the Associated Content guy, I'm having, uh, I'm having dinner with him up in Sunnyvale, actually Mountain View at Fiesta Del Mar. It's right off a of shoreline. Great. You should go there. I'm having dinner with him. And uh, Luke is basically saying, don't, uh, you know, here's what we're doing. Here's how we're going to integrate with your company. And he's like, don't screw this up. You know, I'm all in. I think that we can do amazing things with your company and you can do amazing things with us, but don't screw it up. This company is my life. He was absolutely serious. Every part of his life was that company. His, fa his wife, his kids, his employees were his family. You know, that's who he was bound to, right? Want to make Yahoo successful, but just to be clear, I built this company. Let's make sure that it gives lift to your company and make sure you give lift to what my vision and my goal and my passion was when I started. Very important. Uh, another thing that can cause an entrepreneur to is just not understanding the market. You know, not understanding the value proposition and not focusing on a customer, right? Your passion and your idea should actually have a customer at the end of it somewhere that it, you are solving a massive problem for. They may not know they have the problem. If anybody's seen that great Osco uh, potato peeler, anybody seen the thing? Big fat handle, right? That was actually so solving a problem. If anybody peeled potatoes before, you probably, uh, you probably have somebody that does that for you, but... <laughs> Kidding. Um, poor management. 
There's another thing that can cause a problem, right? And this is one of those know thyself uh, deals. Daniel made a, I'm trying to remember if I can, if I can remember this line. Uh, he, he basically said, you know, there is no, no one is that well-rounded. And his comment was, you know, everybody's got shortcomings. Everybody has them. So if you're the, if you're the leader, the evangelical leader who started your business and you've got it going, know your shortcomings because you're not that well-rounded. Be introspective enough to say, you know, I've got to actually hire people to fill in all these gaps that I've got, and I know I'm not very good at this, so I better go hire somebody to go do that for me. It doesn't matter if you're running a huge organization or a little organization, you should be doing that. Bolster your weaknesses. Know yourself well enough. Nobody's that well-rounded. Your team can be that well-rounded. Um, insufficient capital, that can be kind of death for a, a startup. Or, um, frankly, an overly complex capital structure because the way that you went and got your first couple of rounds were kind of wacky and then you had to go fill in some spots in other places. And now when you try to go get cash, they're looking at all this, a, a, a capital structure that's so confusing that they're like, I don't think I, I, I don't even know where to start with you. Like, who do I pay what to just even get a piece? So that's another thing that can be tough. And if you need that capital to take it to the next step, uh, that can also be... Um, a problem. So, yeah, I, I guess, uh, so I talked about structure, process, and um, flexibility is also important. As I said, you know, when you're planning a business and you put a stake in the ground three years out and say, that's my vision, and now I'm just going to start marching to it and shipping things that get me to that vision. The only thing you know about a three-year vision is it's partially wrong. You know it's not going to be right. Nobody is that sharp. You're going to have to pull up the stake, move it a little bit, and hope that all of the incremental steps you took that got you there um, were directionally right. And you don't have to do a 180-degree course correction. You just got to tack a little bit, which is, you know, okay and should be expected. Have the flexibility to do that while your process actually locks you down. Provocative slide, but, uh, you know, it shouldn't be about that. So, what are, the, what are the things that you need? Be a magnet to attract talent. <laughs> Number one, be a magnet. You've got to be. You've got to be so over the top sometimes that people just want to follow you, if not out of curiosity. Right? Be a magnet. And make sure that the people you hire are also magnets, which is really hard to do when you are kind of strapped with cash, which means, you know, if you're, if you're you know, not going to be able to pay big numbers, then so, you've got to be able to sell your vision so hard and make it so clear that people will just follow you into battle and just die to be in a foxhole with you, no matter how hard the gig is. Wow, I'm in. And that's the person that you're going to want to be there. And hopefully they also shore up some of those weaknesses we talked about um, earlier. Second thing, be a great disambiguator. I see so many little companies that are coming in to try to sell themselves or be acquired that come in and say, well, this is what we do. This is, this is, uh, this is what our value proposition is. And then if you're looking at them, you're going, well, you know, I don't know if I get it. And then all of a sudden, you get this look in their face and they go, well, we can do this too. <laughs> and you're like, oh, uh-oh. So they actually don't have the conviction be, be on, behind um, this disambiguated value proposition. Also, the people in your team, don't ever leave them wondering and, and, and thinking, well, you know, I wonder, what, I wonder what that meant. Like, there should be no wondering on your team of what something meant that you said or a direction that you gave. It should be super clear, and that's how you get small companies to do amazing things. There are teams uh, at Yahoo, frankly, that um, are you know, 12 people big, and they get more done than teams that have 50 in some cases because the communication between them is so much. They know how each other thinks. They talk. They, there's no ambiguity between what their purpose and goal is and what they're trying to get done. And what magic and what a beautiful thing that is to see, right? It's the way small companies operate, the way they should operate. Disambiguate your folks. Uh, be an expert in your field. 
Know every competitor that is around you, whether they are a direct competitor or they are a peripheral. If they're in the periphery and they're doing something that's kind of like you, they may come in and start doing exactly what you're doing. And it also might be a killer opportunity for you to just say, I'm going to vector over into that space because uh, I've got the expertise in my business. It fits with my business model. I know the market. That customer is the same and the problem is just adjacent to the one that I'm solving. I think I'm going to go there too. Know your competitors in those spaces. Very, very important. Um, be a leader. Being a manager and being a leader is different. You know, and being a leader is one of those things that says, you know, I've got to be courageous. I've got to go into a space and think um, I'm going to take no prisoners and I'm going to be as tough as I possibly can. And I'm going to take one for the team. You know, and representing by example. You know, I, f I find some ma amazingly good professional uh, managers that come out of a variety of schools, East Coast, West Coast, NorCal, SoCal, whatever. Uh, and there's a lot of folks that come out with great management skills and have forgotten how to lead and to have people just follow them. Again, that maybe just out of curiosity because they just want to be part of it. So being a leader, be a connector. One of the things that I, I think, you know, I talked about, I have this idea and I don't want anybody to get hold of it. Um, and what folly that is, you know, taking an idea and actually bouncing it off a bunch of people that are in the marketplace, whether it's, you know, Ron Conway in the angel business or some of the things that are happening, a lot of the things that are happening down here in SoCal. There's a lot of people that have knowledge that don't want to be in your business, but, but certainly could give you information about how you might improve yours. And it's, that's an unbelievably invaluable uh, asset to have. Connect yourself with as many places, uh, many people as you can. Uh, I used Jason Nazar earlier as an example. That guy was, you know, an MBA student, and that he was more connected with the VC community uh, in L.A. than anybody. And now he's kind of like the center of the VC community in L.A. I, I don't even know how he did it in like three or four years. Anybody know Jason? Oh, yeah, like everybody knows Jason. <laughs> Point, point taken. The, the guy is just, he's just connected everywhere. I, I run into guys, so Dan Lewin, uh, you know, is a Microsoft guy, actually works in, uh, works in Mountain View. But I didn't know, no Dan had any idea who Jason Nazar is. Oh, yeah, Jason Nazar, I know him. I've talked to Ron Conway. Oh, yeah, Jason Nazar, I know that guy. Like, I've talked to, you know, the, the coastal guys up in uh, the Bay Area. Oh, yeah, I know Jason Nazar. It's like, who the hell doesn't know this guy? That connection allows him to have access to capital, access to advisors, access to talent, access, right? Be a connector. Very, very important. Um, be, a, be courageous and have a ton of conviction. If you, are, if you have a lot of principles that are solid, that you want people to follow, be courageous, have conviction, and don't change them in a situation. Don't. Because folks will look at you and kind of, well, what are you about? And I used to give uh, advice, mentoring advice at Microsoft to guys who would come in and say, you know, I really, want, I really want that next job. I should be a vice president. I know I'm smart enough to be a vice president. I command, uh, you know, these sets of resources. And my advice to him was like, you know, as soon as everybody knows you want to be a vice president and that's what you're thinking about, they're not going to follow you anywhere. If you're telling them that what you really want to do is make great things happen, and making great things happen some days might, might, someday might get you a vice presidency, then they'll want to be along for the ride. If you want to be a vice president, and that's all you want to be, people are going to worry that they're just in the way. If you're trying to make great things happen, they just want to be part of it. So as a principle, that's one of those things you better you know, stick to. And for small businesses, if you think that this is the value proposition. This is what my company is worth. This is how we're going to market. You stick with those principles. And if you're going to change them, you change them with your team. You don't change them and then like explain it to the team. Oh, you know, I made this change. You have to be very consistent. Uh, know your value and don't make others guess. That situation where a company comes in and says, this is what my value is. Here's my company's value proposition. Uh, what do you think? And then you question it and they tack to a different uh, place and they're, now they're nervous and think that you know, maybe my technology could be used for anything. Very frightening moment for an entrepreneur and very frightening moment for somebody who's thinking about acquiring a company. If you are about to be acquired or you're thinking about being acquired because a company has expressed interest in you, 
You hold your value proposition solid. You talk about what technical assets you have. And if there's something that that company thinks they can do with you that's different than what you're doing, you let them come up with it. And if they come up with it and say, you know, I'm thinking differently about what you might do, and you already know it, then start riffing with them about uh, how you might be able to change another fundamental business that they've got. If your value proposition is changing a fundamental business that they've got, that's great but make sure that's your value prop going in. So, whether you're in a, in a big business or you are starting your own, either one, you make the job. One of the things at Microsoft that was very apparent to me was if you can bring passion to a job and you can have some ideas, you can make that job your own. You can create it inside a big company. If you have all of the DNA that it takes to be an entrepreneur and you believe that you're willing to take those risks and you feel so strongly about something you're willing to risk paycheck, family, mortgage your house, second mortgage your house, third mortgage, like whatever you've got to do to go make that idea happen, well, great, go do that but do it with conviction and don't be afraid of failure. You'll fail, you'll get back up, you'll try it again, you might fail again and sometimes, and certainly when you're in a big company, you have a little bit more leeway to do this. You learn a hell of a lot more from your failures than you do from your successes as it turns out. And um, if you keep going back and trying and you use those things that you've learned while you failed, it's amazing how much better the next one gets. So, what time is it? Five to nine. Just about. So I got five minutes for Q&A, and I think I'm on, I uh, got you back on track. So, for those of you who got uh, in that traffic jam, sorry about that. Um, that's, that's that. So, questions? That's my Twitter um, handle, by the way, if anybody wants to add me. It's not that provocative, but uh, <laughs> it's not, certainly not my Facebook page. Any questions, anybody? No one. This is awesome. I gotta say, this is great. <laughs> How yes. Is the, uh, Yahoo product, uh, what's next? Oh, well, so how's uh, Yahoo product development? What's next? So uh, I've been there six months. Uh, upon joining, uh, it became relatively apparent that there were lots of really interesting strategies, uh, and not an overall binding vision for the company. So. Um, in the last six months, we've created a vision, product vision, created a product strategy. The product vision is bring personal meaning to the web. Uh, it's not bringing personal meaning to Yahoo, it's to the web. So that consists of five strategic elements. Engaging and delighting customers with doing the basics right and doing things that extend out into the web and not on Yahoo's owned and operated. Going deeply mobile, we've started to flip and uh, start to take folks on iPad, on Droid, on iOS, uh, iPhone devices. Uh, to a very large degree. Um, in fact, we're developing on those devices first. Our new mail client went on those devices before they went to the PC. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, if you have kids, they're spending more time typing on glass than they're typing on keyboards. They, they might actually do their uh, term paper on a keyboard, but if they're talking with their friends, they're doing it on a glass screen. Five years from now, ten years from now, all these guys with laptops up will just be a glass panel on a desk and they'll be typing and they'll be IR to a printer somewhere and that's that. So that's the next one. Uh, that's the second element, which is sort of being where the customer goes and, and doing mobile. The middle, uh, the center of it is all about science and data. One thing that very few folks know about Yahoo, and it's one of the reasons I actually joined the company, was they have the, uh, the largest uh, Hadoop infrastructure, the largest open source infrastructure, private infrastructure uh, in the world today. Very few people know that. So they have you know, petabytes of data going through this thing on a daily basis. They have uh, billions of transactions going through a solid data grid. So everything that happens, every piece of content that you see served on Yahoo all comes from the same grid. Uh, it, it can infer information about you, they change that homepage, uh, serve three million different versions of that homepage per day based on what you think, just based on inferred data. Uh, we will go to, in the next three years, go to a state where everybody who goes to Yahoo is logged in, not with a Yahoo ID, your Facebook ID, your Twitter ID, your Gmail ID, it doesn't matter. You know, the authentication wars are over, so we will uh, do that. 
Next is actually doing a social networking in the way that actually matters, which is small groups of people. Everybody, including Facebook, knows they have to go there because of the problem that I described. I'll describe it in a more uh, meaningful way. My 16-year-old, I was at, actually I was at a wedding in Carmel for um, the guy who does biz dev for Facebook, Bubba Marika, actually. So I was at this wedding in Carmel, and while I'm at, ironically, while I'm at this wedding for this Facebook guy, I get a Facebook notification that there's this awesome raging party at Parker's house. Parker's my son. <laughs> so, so, as it turns out, there's a raging high school party going on at my house while I'm 120 miles away. Cool, I learned it via Facebook because that broadcast social mechanism uh, runs out of gas when your, you know, your, your graph gets too darn big. Uh, and so we're actually doing small groups of folks where you can imagine typing an email to seven of your friends, having that email say, hey, do you want to persist? Sorry, geek speak. Do you want to save this group? You save the group. Now you've got a group of eight people. Everything that, in the, that was in the email contextually is wrapped with it in that big data grid that I talked about. And so now as you're roaming the web, every piece of information that was highlighted or that was marked and data, meta tagged in that piece of data, as I go out on the web, I can see little chunks of it highlight it if I so desire, click on it, and talk to that group about it. That's social networking, what we're doing uh, in that space. Funny thing is everybody knows Microsoft, Google, um, Facebook, all has to go there. It's just, you know, what's the asset package you take with you as you go? And then uh, fifth is ecosystem, doing a bunch of ecosystem stuff where everything that we're doing on top of Yahoo's owned and operated sites, people think of Yahoo as a destination, right? Did you know that they run the largest, we run the largest uh, advertising exchange uh, in the world today called Right Media Exchange. So we actually have advertisements and an advertising system all over the web. You know, there's a high likelihood that what you're seeing served somewhere in display market is actually being served out of Yahoo's back end. Start thinking about the same thing for content. People push content into that huge data grid I talked about, we'll push it back out, make that another re resource for um, uh, developers. So they can consume content, they can deliver content, they can share it, and a content exchange emerges. And everything that I just described about that social network also happens out on the web. So that's, you know, that's sort of what, uh, that's the super shorthand, which can be a, a hour-long discussion about what Yahoo, um, Yahoo is, uh, is doing uh, on product. And it's, it's happening very, uh, very quickly. Yes, Susan. The MOAS, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I cannot agree with you about the operation. May, I, may we learn from you about what are your roles and columns in how you design the organization in terms of resources to get them rolling in the same direction? So uh, that's a good question. So um, the way that Yahoo was formed back in, um, you know, over history has been business units. Right? It was an or a, a company that was formed organically. So you'd have a general manager of sports, a general man a manager of entertainment, the general manager of the homepage. So what that ended up creating was a lot of little silos and very little shared code, right? So what, what the organization you know, did the two-page vision, the 20-page strategy. When we did that 20-page, more a strategic initiative document, I had a, I took my direct reports to an offsite for three days and we said, what's the best way to go deliver this thing? Because we have to do this horizontally if we're actually gonna scale it up. We cannot, we have to break out of these silos completely. So what we ended up doing was forming engineering teams that are in fact vertical, but focus on very broad areas. So there's a media, there's data, there's communications, there's search, and if you think of the corpus of all the engineers that do uh, things in these groups, they're very applicable across each other. And then we said we're going to have horizontal, um, horizontal functions that will actually drive commonality across these things. So you think of vertical engineering organizations and then horizontal functions like product management, horizontal. Product marketing, horizontal. U user experience, UED, user experience design and user experience research, horizontal. Global development and localization, horizontal. And those things actually allow us to drive scenarios across all of these uh, devices. If you think about, or all these, these orgs, and if you think about the underlying platform, there's another group structurally that sits underneath it that thinks of only cloud and platform technology that everybody else bolts into, right? And every group that I talked about actually does a platform of some kind, but they're all dependent 
on this platform layer that sits below, which is honestly the largest, uh, the largest team. The complexity of it for us is that uh, we have 70, 70 development sites. 70. 70. Wow. Lots and lots. Probably um, more that's feasible, frankly. But you know, if you've got um, if you've got an open dialogue that you can establish, if you have synergy around the vision, synergy around the strategy, and you actually have this horizontal scenario layer that, that have people driving these common scenarios through, and I'm a scenario-based engineer guy, you know, I look at a scenario, find the value proposition, and it makes sure it meets a customer's requirement, and then drive it across all of those uh, all of those groups. That's that's the only way to make that, that happen. Um, the, 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 the distributed development environment, because we're consistent on strategy and because we actually don't have that siloed, um, that siloed organization, can get things done across, across teams. So we have guys that are managing groups from Sunnyvale that are actually in Bangalore, guys that are in Bangalore managing resources uh, in Sunnyvale. You know, it's, uh, it, it, like Friedman said, man, it's a, it's a flat world, really flat. With, with the exception of time, which is a, a problem uh, occasionally. But you know, we have to have meetings at 7 a.m. to make sure that we're accommodating guys in Bangalore. Sometimes we're having them at 7 p.m. Um, that's, that's just the way it works. But you, know, you, get some, you get some amazing engineering uh, resources and talent in uh, Beijing if you position yourself close to Tsinghua University. And uh, in Bangalore or Mumbai, it's pretty, uh, pretty crazy, some of the, some of the talent that's there. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.